If you've got your Bibles, feel free to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to do a little bit of an introduction first, and then we'll go through the first 17 verses briefly to just cover what, what the intro to this chapter there is. So I think Herman's got himself an intro prepared here for us. Amen. Yeah, so um, just to, I think when we, we go over a book of the Bible, it sometimes helps a little bit if we um, get a little bit of context to it. It'd be kind of like if we had somebody that wrote a letter to Port Burwell, it'd be kind of interesting to know what it was all about so that we would understand why he was writing it and that kind of thing. And so to give a little bit of a description about the city of Corinth, um, there's somebody that has described it like this, a mixture of New York City, of Los Angeles, and Las Vegas in the ancient world. If you know anything about some of these cities, you know that um, in these cities, there's, there's, a, there's a, a high crime rate, um, there's a lot of um, immorality, there's a, you know, sin. Sin often seems to find these kinds of places in, in the ancient world, uh, when the New Testament was written, uh, Corinth was kind of known as a, as a place where people could indulge in the pleasures of the flesh. And, uh, and so it, it gives us a bit of an understanding, a little bit of the culture of Corinth. The, the land geographically um, sat on, a, on a, what is called an isthmus, which is a narrow strip of land uh, that was connected to northern Greece. Um, some other things, it was a trade route for the ancient world. It was a bit of a crossroad. So um, Corinth was also considered to be a very, very wealthy city. And so there was um, a lot of business to be had, a lot of commerce. There were city ports uh, right on the Mediterranean there. Um, boats were offloaded and cargo was transported over the land here. Smaller boats were moved along in, in this particular geographic area too. You might have seen some pictures of a, of a canal. Um, so it's actually interesting. The emperor Nero started building this canal, and it was actually finished in 1893. So like 1,800 years later, pretty much, it was finally finished. Um, so so just, there's a little bit of background there. Um, some popular phrases was, uh, and this kind of spoke to the wealth of Corinth, People would say, not everyone can go to Corinth. It might be something, you know, we might in similar ways today say, not everyone can go to Dubai or something like that. You know, it was known to be a pretty ritzy place. Uh, one of the, the other things about Corinth, like we talked about how, how Corinth was, um, was, it was uh, an evil place. One of the things that made it really um, sensual and really really wicked, was uh, it housed the temple of, of um, Apollo and the temple of uh, Epaphrodite. And, and so if you, actually I'm saying that wrong, it's Aphrodite. Uh, if you know anything about Aphrodite, you know that the Corinthians worshipped at the idol of sex. And so in this temple, um, they would have prostitutes that would serve the purposes of their worship. And so you can kind of understand maybe why people would have kind of known it as a, as a sin city because of some of those things. It was, uh, it was a very perverse city. And it's interesting to note that from this city, the Apostle Paul wrote the book to the Romans. And, and a lot of people think that uh, you know, particularly when he's writing Romans chapter 1, and he's talking about how, how culture and, and people have denied God, they're worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Um, a lot of people believe that as Paul was observing the culture around him, it gave him um, uh, the inspiration to write about these kinds of things as the Spirit of God led him uh, to the church at Rome. A um, little bit of more background about the Apostle Paul here. He had a very extensive relationship with the city. Um, in, in fact, it's believed that uh, 
Paul established the first major church here in, 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 in the Greek world here. And uh, this is also where he met Priscilla and Aquila. If you go back to Acts chapter 18, um, you're, you're somewhat familiar with that. He lived among them for 18 months when he visited them. Um, later on, uh, in AD 54, Paul hears disturbing news about the church in, Cor in uh, Corinth here. And it says here, um, some of the history about it is that we have to remember that when the church was established there, the New Testament had not yet been written. I don't know if you ever stopped to think about it. You think of, of how, how somebody has heard the teachings of Jesus, and that was true about the Corinthian church. Paul had spoken to them about, about the teachings of Christ, about the new covenant, but the Bible had not yet been written. And so they were attempting to live for Christ in a very immoral setting, a very uh, worldly type of setting. And so when you get into this letter, um, it's believed that the, the Corinthian church carried a letter to the Apostle Paul, and in this letter they had all kinds of questions, and they wanted Paul to settle their disagreements. And so that's why Paul addresses a number of topics in this book, like marriage, uh, divorce, idols, spiritual gifts, um, giving to the poor, uh, we get into tongues, you know, uh, communion, there's so many different topics. And it's, it's believed that because the church was living in a really immoral setting, that they had a lot of questions because as often what happens is when, when a church lives in a very worldly setting, parts of the world sometimes creep into the church. And that was the case here as well. Parts of the world had crept into the church. And so the, the Corinthians wanted Paul to give them wisdom, to give them instruction on how they were supposed to deal with um, some of these things here. And so uh, you'll see that Paul, Paul um, addresses some of these things. Um, he also confronts them about certain things, about sin in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we'll get into some of those things, sin in the church. Um, but, you know, just, just so you know, the, the church at Corinth was, I think, in many ways similar to what the church is going through today, the church of Jesus Christ is going through today. And in many ways, we look at the church today and we see that parts of the world have crept into the church and so often as a church leadership, we end up dealing with the broken lives of people and broken relationships and in hard circumstances in people's lives because they've wandered off of um, the true path that God has called them to. They've moved away from the Word of God. And because they've moved away from the Word of God, now there's brokenness that has come in because of their decisions. And so... Um, life becomes complicated. And then you start to raise your hand and you start to say, well, what about my situation? Like, like how do you answer my problems in my life? And so often, um, when, when you turn towards carnality and towards the world and you, you build upon a foundation that is based upon human philosophy, human reasoning, uh, it doesn't take too long before things around you begin to crumble. And you start to ask tough questions. You start to ask, you know, why am I in this mess? You know, Lord, help me out of here. And, and you look to wisdom and those kinds of things. And I believe that's, this, this is a very important scripture passage to us um, because of some of those things. Yeah, for those that are interested, if you read in the book of Acts, chapter 18, I believe that's where, where you can read where Paul founded the church at Corinth. So it's an interesting uh, side note there, but it's... Uh, important to kind of know where along his journey or where along the book of Acts even because it kind of describes Paul's life from front to back beginning to end and chapter 18 about is where the church of Corinth was established you know some of the things he deals with here as well is you hear this a lot even now where people would say Jesus yes but God no there people are interested in truth they're interested in Jesus but but the church no they're not interested in in uh, a church full of hypocrites, 
But Jesus, yeah, that we can follow. He was, he was righteous and he was perfect and he was clean and all those things. And yet, uh, when they look at the church, they realize that the church is full of hypocrites. And you know what? Our church is no different. We're all a bunch of hypocrites, really. When you think about it, none of us can live a perfect life. None of us is perfect. And that is the reason why Jesus came in the first place. So kind of similarities there too. Hmm. But let's read a uh, bunch of verses here, and then we'll kind of go over them as we go. Starting in verse 1, he says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that, it, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech, and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it, have been, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none may say that you were baptized in my name. I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. <clears throat> Thus far, we're going to just cover up to that point today, up to uh, the end of verse uh, 17 there. I appreciate how he starts his letters always, and this is when you, when you do some research on how the canon was, was prepared, how, how the New Testament was assembled, and what kind of criteria they used. It's important to note that there was a I forget the amount of people, amount of scholars that kind of all had to go through the information there, but one, one way how they could identify that was Paul's writing is he always identifies himself, and there was witnesses who knew of Paul who wrote it, and the ones that were writing it, there had to be, I, I'm going to probably say it wrong if I say how many witnesses there had to be, but there had to be I count witnesses mm -hmm. of all these things before they would take this in as Scripture. It had to be for sure, without a doubt, writings of Paul. So he addresses the, the church here by saying, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother. So he's, he's saying here, first of all, that he is a brother, because his friend here is also his brother, that, that he's writing together with. He's saying, by the will of God. And if we remember his trip to Damascus where he wanted to persecute the church, all of a sudden, this light comes, and, and the one time I said, and then he falls off of his horse, but that's actually not in Scripture. <laughs> that was in a movie. <laughs> right? It's important that we actually make note of that. Sometimes we, we have these pictures in our head, and we think, oh, this is how it happened, because somebody's portrayal of that particular scene in a movie, sometimes that helps shape what you think it actually says when it doesn't. But anyway, he was called by God, and he says who it's to. First, he has to identify himself, him, and who's with him. And then he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those that are sanctified. So we have to remember this whole letter when we're reading it, we're going through all the different things that, that he's telling us that we can read here. It is meant to be to the church of God, not the outside, not the non-believers. Non, non it says to those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is not meant to be a, I mean, it's meant to draw people to Christ, yes, but this is meant 
specifically to the believers that are at Corinth. They are those that are sanctified, called to, to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He's, he's saying this is a, an important letter that I'm writing you, called by God to the church at Corinth that is the saints, the ones that are called to, or the ones that are sanctified by Christ, the ones that are called to be saints. It's important to note that we can't say, oh, here he's saying something to the non-believers. He's, unless he's referencing, saying this is to the, to the outside people, this letter is meant to be read as if he's saying it to us, the church, the ones that are saved and sanctified. Amen. Amen. So let's uh, look at verse 4 there. Um, we'll go move on a little bit further up there. Um, where Paul starts, he, he thanks God because God poured grace upon these believers here. And just to, if you, to go back again, I'll give you a little bit of background. Paul came from Athens, and in Athens, he had a hard time preaching the gospel. Very few people came to faith in the Lord. But it, it seems like here in Corinth, it changed. Uh, there were likely many that came to faith in the Lord through his preaching, and, and what Paul does, though, is he, he says, I thank God for the grace which was given to you. And, and so he, he never failed to realize that. You see that in a theme throughout his, uh, his letters. He, he says, you know, because you're aware now, God has given, open up your eyes. He says, the grace of God has revealed himself to you. And because the grace of God has revealed himself to you, now you have an opportunity to believe. Now you can see. And I... I love that about God, that when it comes to our redemption, He always takes the first step. He's always done that. And, and that's what makes Him the God that He is. You know, so, so we go to verses like Romans 5, 8 that says that while, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and He died for us. And so we didn't take the first step of reconciliation. God took the first step through Jesus Christ and He pours grace upon us and it's through that grace that we are, we, we actually see our need for him. If it wasn't for the grace of God, uh, every single one of us would still be lost in our sins. But God reveals himself to us. He, he opens up our eyes to see him, and then we embrace him, which is, is really incredible. In verse 5 there, um, he talks about us being enriched in him, in speech, in knowledge, um, Verse 7, he says, So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 8, he says, He will confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I, I love that thought too. And I, I think we should just, just think about that just a little bit here. That, you know, he, he loves us and will confirm us to the end. He will never let us go. He, he's begun, he begun a good work in us, and he will bring that work to completion. And so sometimes we, we might be tempted to think like the, like the Corinthians here. We might be tempted to think, you know, there's so much wickedness. There's so much evil, and we see some of the effects of it having, you know, even creeping into the church. <clears throat> and yet, God says here that he will confirm this he will confirm this process of salvation to the end, even to the point of blamelessness. He says, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that, that phrase, being blameless. Yeah, even if you think of that, where he confirms us to the end, where he sustains us to the end, where he presents us faultless, you know, sometimes we hold certain individuals that we deem to be like super spiritual or these great Christians and they are without fault, without mistake, and yet all of a sudden reports come out where they themselves had fallen as well. The enemy will not stop attacking God's people just because you now have a faith in Christ. He's going to attack all the more, right? So we have to be careful that we don't put anybody up on a pedestal because the enemy is out to seek. He's out to seek to kill, destroy, and... and uh, it doesn't matter how well established you are in the faith, and by your own merits, if you're trying to sustain yourself 
you fall, but then we have this promise where he says he will do it to the end so that he can present us faultless. Without that, we are all hopeless if he doesn't, if, if he isn't the one who presents us uh, faultless at the end. It says God is faithful by whom we are called into the fellowship of his son. It's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful phrase. Okay, um, so we want to spend quite a bit of our, the rest of our time on the next, the next part there, because um, I believe it's a very relevant uh, passage there, starting at verse 10. And he says here, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So when you think about that, that scripture passage there, um, the Apostle Paul is not saying here that um, he wants everybody to look, look the same, to dress the same. You know, sometimes we, we get uniformity mixed with unity. We think uniformity demonstrates unity. You know, if everybody, you know, wears the same shirts and the same pants and the same skirts and, and, and everybody looks, looks alike within the building, then we have a spirit of unity. And that isn't actually at all what he's saying here. Um, what he's saying here is that, that in our thought, and notice what he says here, that you're united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So I'm grateful that, that in the church here, when, when it comes to our doctrine, our, the things that we believe, our statement of faith, most of us are very like-minded to those things. And I, I believe to the greatest extent that that's probably what he's referring to here, that, that we are like-minded people, that we have the same mind and in the same judgment. And, uh, and yet, uh, we have our own character and our own personalities. And so most of us know that, that our characters, our, our personalities, our love languages, our our bent in life, even the gifts that God has given us, they, they have a tendency, they have the possibility of causing division because we might think differently than someone else. And in our world today, we see that everywhere. We see, we see um, you know, we, we need to have some division. It's good for us to have division when it comes to things from the world. We'll see, in the, in, for example, in 2 Corinthians 6, where, where Paul actually says, go out from among them and be ye separate. So there's a need for division. Where, you know, light is not supposed to link itself together with darkness. So, so some division has to happen. But he says, in the church, and, and I, I specifically think that he's talking about the local body. Because in, in today's world, we see different denominations. We see um, different factions of Christians. We, we hear of the... Um, you know, sometimes the debate between uh, people who are Calvinistic-minded and those who are who would say, "No, I'm an Arminianist, and and I don't uh, I don't follow the teachings of John Calvin." And so we see we see people disagreeing with some of those kinds of things. Um, but in the in the local church, there ought to be um, an understanding that we're all pushing in the same direction. Or pulling in the same direction. And so there's an understanding that, you know, God has given us a leadership. He's given us direction. He's given us a commission. He's given us responsibilities. He's given us different gifts and different talents. And so it's almost like as Christians, we're put in this giant melting pot. And, and God is saying, I want you to, in that melting pot, I want you to be unified. <laughs> I want you to have the same mind and the same judgment. And, and so, but us, because we, we uh, often base our thinking on human reasoning, which I said earlier we ought not to do, we get into conflict with each other. Um, and so we, we start to label people, we start to come up with things like, like he's a Calvinist, or, you know, <laughs> um, he's a... He's a, a, a Pentecost or a, a, a Pentecostal guy. He's a Mennonite or 
a Baptist or, or you know, some of these kinds of labels that we put out there, right? Um, sometimes we call each other stubborn or, uh, you know, we, we disagree vehemently. Sometimes, sometimes our biggest disagreements are based on terminology. You know, sometimes we're saying the same thing, but we, we um, have a different, maybe a different background, a different uh, source of education. And so we say things based on our experiences and our influences and on those who taught us. And so, so then we, we often get into conflict with each other like they did here. He says here that it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. And, and so he, th- some of these are saying, well, I follow the Apostle Paul, you know, and his teaching. And others were like, I follow Apollos. Apollos was uh, this great orator, this gifted speaker. And many people loved him. He was a very popular man. Or some people said, I follow Cephas or Peter. You know, I, I prefer his style of doing things. And then there were others who got it right and said, well, I follow Jesus. I follow Christ. And so in this melting pot, there were people that had that had personality things, just like some of you here. You know, some of you may, may be sitting here or you may be thinking, you know, I identify more with that guy. When you're listening maybe to popular preachers, you're like, you know, I, I love David Jeremiah's style of preaching. I, I, I love Chuck Swindle's style of preaching or Adrian Rogers or something like that um, or J. Vernon McGee. And so, so if we're not careful, though, we can get in conflict with somebody who says, oh, you know, if you don't listen to Timothy Keller, you know, I, you know, I, I'm going to write you off. Or, you know, we, we do this as Christian people, right? We, we pick our favorite uh, preachers and teachers, and then, and then because their way of speaking kind of clicks with us, uh, we tend to lean their way, and then we, we're also prone to take things out of context, and then we argue and debate among each other. And, and he says here, he says, it's actually been reported to me that this is what you guys are doing. And he says, I, I've asked you to be of the same mind and the same judgment. And, and he says, as, a, as, as the outside world is watching you uh, and sees the infighting within, um, it, it takes away from the glory of God. And so he, he's encouraging the church there, stop focusing on these things and and, and, and I believe the Corinthian church was a church that majored on the minors. And sometimes you hear that term, uh, majoring on minors. And, and that's why Paul spends almost the whole time in 1 Corinthians, in every chapter, uh, talking about some of these peripheral things, some of these preferences, and, and, uh, and things that were not as important, some of them, and some of them were very important, but some of them not as important because people were, were willing to develop factions among themselves. And, and, and that's when a, when a church is at its probably one of its most unhealthy spots, it's when there's factions in the church. When there's a group of people that says, oh, I can't stand the way they're doing things here. And, 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 and one of the ways that that can even happen here. And, I, and you know, Pete and I have witnessed it even in the last year where we have met with, for example, the school that meets in the, in the building here. And the school has, some people from the school have said things like, oh, the church is against us. The church, the church doesn't like us. The church doesn't want us here. And then, and then there's, there's people from the church that have said things sometimes like, yeah, the school, I, I think they... They really, you know, they don't care about anything. They, they don't care about um, the fact that we want a nice building. We want it to be clean. And they're always like, making messes everywhere. And, and so, so sometimes as a leadership, we get caught in between that sometimes where people are like, well, I'm with this group and I'm with that group. Or sometimes the Sunday school says, no, uh, nobody listens to us and the way we do things and want to do things. So, so we can get caught up in those kinds of the, the same things. Um, it, it works in so many areas. It can be music styles. It can be, you know, we, we all have the ability to have the same mind and the same judgment, or we can develop factions among ourselves like they did here. 
And we can say, well, well, I like the way this elder is doing it, or I like the way that elder is doing it, or that deacon is doing it. And you know what? I don't really care what anybody in church does. I'm just going to do what me and my group do. We'll just have our own Bible study, and we'll just kind of ignore what everybody else is doing. We can, we can develop a mindset like that. And, and, and praise the Lord, I'm, I'm so blessed that in our elders' meetings we can talk about these things, and, and uh, we have a, a, an amazing spirit of unity there. So just so you know, you can't pull one of the elders aside. <laughs> Doesn't work here. Uh, we, you know, God has blessed us with a great sense of unity. I'm, I'm not saying the enemy can't cause division. And, and we pray against that, though, regularly. Um, but, you know, those are, those are just a few ways that some of these things happen. Even if, that, uh, mm-hmm. even if that thought has been there at some point where a certain, let's say, a certain cry has been made to one elder to say, oh, hey, we should... That gets brought up at the meeting anyways before anything is decided. So it doesn't, like you are saying, it doesn't work. We always talk about these things anyway, so you can't pull one direction or, in the, or a different one. And we never make a, a decision unless we're all unified in that decision anyways. So we can't have one person making decisions with, without the rest of them knowing it anyway. Uh, another thing I think what, uh, what he's talking about here too when he says that I follow Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Christ, in, in Corinth they were, they were looking to latch on to the person with the highest uh, status in society, somebody who they could attach themselves to that they would be well known as well, that they would be kind of climbing the, the ladder of, uh, of society there too. And some were thinking, well, that's Paul. He is probably the highest we can achieve, so let's attach ourselves to him. And others were saying, oh, but this Apollos guy, have you heard him preach? He comes and he's this great guy too. And the others are saying, no, Cephas or Peter, the one that was uh, probably the closest to, to Jesus other than uh, the, the, uh, John. And the others are saying, no, no, but I'm following Christ. So they had like these four different uh, positions that they're trying to fight for. Like, who's going to be the highest? Who's going to be coming in first place? And he says, no, Christ isn't divided. Hmm. All of these that you have mentioned are all go, uh, fighting for the same thing. They're pulling in the same direction. And you can't get any further ahead anywhere by picking one or the other. It's Christ that they're preaching. And that's important here. And sometimes we see that in the church too, like you were just saying, sometimes you see, if you think that Herman will lean one way more and then you try to attach yourself to him and trying to convince him to make a certain change in the church or something, and another one says, oh, but you know, I'm not against, or I'm not for that kind of change, so I'll go talk to Peter or Jake or Jake and try to get, try to attach ourselves to certain ones so that we can get our preference done. And you know what, the point of of the local body of church here isn't that anybody gets their preferences met. It's that we, t- that we bind together in this unity of mind that we all together, first of all, exalt Christ, glorify Him, and see what, if we can honor Him with our lives rather than saying, what can I do? How can I get my preferences met in the church? That's kind of what Paul is saying here. Is Christ divided? Hmm. Is He divided? Like, He's not divided. No. Do we treat Him like He is? Very often we do, right? Like, there's these these believers that we would say, oh, but this person's probably going to do what I want, not realizing that that same spirit that connects us to Christ is the same spirit that connects us to each other. Mm. We're not divided. We're all equal. And like what he says next, he goes, is, was Paul crucified for you? That's a pretty interesting statement to make because he's, they're trying to attach themselves to these different names and trying to see who can be, uh, get in first place or the highest uh, position in the church maybe and and he asked him, like, if you're saying you identify with me, like, well, did I get crucified for you? It's a rhetorical question because he wouldn't be asking it if he was, right? He wasn't, uh, he wasn't crucified for them, and he didn't baptize anybody. Nobody was baptized in his name. And then he makes a statement saying, I didn't even baptize any of you. Oh, except for mm-hmm. Crispus and Gaius, so that nobody can say that they were baptized in my name. Mm-hmm. I like that because he's saying it's not about me. When there's a leader who... If any one of these four leaders would have said, yeah, I know that Paul was just here, but now that I came, follow me. I have a better way. Paul is saying no. He's saying, Let, let's, let's not get into that at all. Nobody got baptized in my name. It's about Christ. Amen. It's his name. Yeah, so that, that whole topic there, uh, I mean, sometimes I think people, people get a bit fired up about the, the term baptism. And, and, and I think that the... the this whole area of baptism, I think sometimes our own background has made a mountain out of something like this, right? We, are, we have, we have um, made a doctrine out of baptism. And, 
And uh, I don't want to really get into that for the sake of time today. But I want you just to look that, uh, at, at the Apostle Paul here. And in his viewpoint, he recognized that the greatest calling in his life was to preach the gospel. And that's why he says here, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And uh, he says, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He says, you know, God gave me a simple message. And the simple message was that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Simple message. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised from the dead, you will be saved. And Paul says, that's what God called me to. That's what, when I had this encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, that's what he called me to. And he says, but in the church, we get caught up in, in all kinds of useless drivel. You know, we start emphasizing um, like factions and people and like Apollos and Cephas and, and all of these things. And, and we build these massive doctrines on, on uh, something that we don't even understand. And before you know it, we've divided ourselves from our family and our friends and and, uh, and we get caught up in ter uh, you know, terminology and all these different things. And, and he says, you know, Christ didn't call me to that. He, he gave me a purpose, and it was to preach the gospel. And so if there's a message that you can take away from this, I would encourage all of you to recognize that too, that the, the driving point in all of our lives, I honestly believe this, is to fulfill the Great Commission. And... And I think every one of us can say, Christ has also called us to preach the gospel. So let's not major on minors. Let's not, let's not focus on, on, uh, on the terms that other people have placed upon the Christian church, whether it's Baptist or Mennonite or Calvinist or whatever it might be. Let's, let's focus on the truth of the Word of God. And let's spread the message to a world out there that's dying. A world out there that is struggling and is in need of the Lord Jesus. You know, I believe baptism is important. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for sure. Water baptism is a picture and demonstrates that. I believe that to be important too. But, but let's not emphasize that above the gospel. You know, uh, over and over again, as, as a board of elders, we, we've brought up this topic sometimes because we get asked some, some questions that, that are sometimes... Um, you know, cause us to seek the Lord about whether, whether we are going to close doors to people by doing certain things when it comes to baptism. Um, and we've chosen many, many times, and I can think back to the last 20 years, the last 17 years that I've been on the Board of Elders, one of our, our constant thoughts that we go back to is, what is Jesus calling us to? And we always go back to this thought, that he wants us to preach the gospel. That the gospel is more important than any doctrine that would divide. And so sometimes we don't fully understand some of these truths, some of these doctrines. Um, but instead of majoring on minors, let's consider the, the, the overarching um, truths that God wanted us to understand. And, uh, and, and I just believe that that, that God wants to populate heaven with the most amount of people. He wants salvation to go to the ends of the earth. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants people to be saved. And, and so I think that ought to be our motivation. And I think that's kind of what he's saying here. Yeah, if, uh, and he's saying that to preach the gospel not with eloquent wisdom. And if anybody could have, from all the people that were writing these books of the New Testament, Paul could have. He was a well-learned man. He was incredibly wise and knowledgeable. And he says, not with eloquent wisdom. Mm. Because if I make it too fancy and too complicated, that empties the cross of its power because it's simple. He says, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He's not going to use fancy words. He's not going to use this eloquent wisdom because it's simple. Because he says, just paraphrasing, he's saying, I want even the youngest child to be able to understand that Christ is the way and he died on that cross for you. He doesn't want it to be fancy so that they have to try to scratch their heads and think, okay, well, how can I obtain this? Hmm. No, it's simple. The cross of Christ, he accomplished what you and I never could. And he goes, that's the message, and that's what we need to keep simple. Amen.
and pray to close this session part off, and then we'll sure. get into a prayer request yet. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the gospel and the simple truths of it, Lord. Father, as we think of our church that meets locally here, and Father, as we pray for believers everywhere who meet, Lord, help us to understand the calling upon our lives. Lord, help us to understand that you have given us a task, Lord, to, to share the good news of the gospel. Sometimes we get caught up in, uh, in things, Lord, that, that we ought not to, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to surrender to you, to be led by you, to be filled by your spirit, to be led by the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that we would, when we make decisions here, that we would be united with the same mind and the same judgment. Father, fill us with your spirit so that Christ can be exalted here and that every single ministry, every single branch of Lighthouse Gospel Church would exude Jesus Christ. Father, help us, Lord, to, to be loving, to be compassionate, to be caring, to be filled with you, Lord, so that the world around us can look inside and, and see not uniformity, but unity, Lord. So, Lord, we, we look to you for that. We look to you for, for you to pour your spirit upon us in these days that we are living in. Lord, help us to to be like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.